Hello, I'd like to welcome you to the next presentation in a series of work topical videos. Today, we will cover at a very high level the three required budgetary elements, the SF424, the SF424A, and the budget narrative. If you're new to us, I'm Nicole Dunn with Chamberlain Dunn LLC. We're a consulting firm based out of Indianapolis, Indiana. We've been working with ARC for the past several years, including an evaluation of power as well as technical assistance for the work applicants and work grantees as they implement their projects. You probably know ARC represents 13 states in the Appalachian region, 423 counties now, and their mission is to innovate, partner, and invest to build community capacity and strengthen economic growth in Appalachia to help the region achieve socioeconomic parity with the nation. These webinars are presented on behalf of ARC to assist applicants in their region with their work applications, although we also welcome you if you're from the Delta region. So I said this would be a high level video, and the reason for that is because there is a much longer, much more thorough video that is available to you through Workforce GPS. It's the official um, SF424, 424A, 424B, if you ever apply for a project that requires one of those. Um, and the project, or excuse me, the budget narrative uh, video that is from Department of Labor. So I have the URL here on the slide. That's a lot to type in. So if you go to workforcegps.org and search for how to apply for a grant, you will see um, what's in this little gray box here. It's one of the top probably five search items um, that, that are returned. So um, it was posted in May 2022 also. So that's a good one to make sure you have the most recent version. So it has two parts. There's a grant application 101 piece and then a second piece focused on these budgetary forms. So if you click on that search item, you'll see both of those presentations pop up in, in the um, page that it then takes you to. If you are new to these forms, I would strongly encourage that you watch that whole video, which I'm not going to recreate here, but I will go through some of the highlights for you for those of you who just like a refresh. So you'll want to review the SF424 ASAP to make sure you have all the basic information that's required. You don't want to be caught at the very end thinking this form is just formality, you know, it's easy to fill out and realizing that you don't actually have all of the elements that are required. So at least glance at it, at least make sure that you're familiar with the terms, familiar with the required parts especially, um, and then, you know, go remedy that if you don't have some of the elements that are required. So. I've mentioned this in some of the other videos. You'll want to re retrieve the most recent forms from the FOA link on grants.gov. The forms don't change often. I think it's been quite a long time, but you might as well be confident that you have the right ones. So you'll note that there is no specified format for the budget narrative. So the forms you're pulling down will just be the SF424 and the 424A. You want to consider your budget as the financial plan for achieving your objectives. So the budget, the activities, and the timeline should all work together in a seamless, logical system. When your progress is reviewed, your FPO will look at achievement of your activities and performance metrics, of course, but they will also look at spend down to, to use it as a proxy for grant progress. You will also want to consider differences across years when totaling. So although the SF424 and the 424A will ask for totals, not annual amounts, you want to be as accurate as possible in your totals and as logical as possible in your justification. So we recommend breaking your budget down in the planning phases and then roll it back up. Um, so that could be done on a quarterly basis. It could be done on a monthly basis if you anticipate a lot of change. At minimum, we would do it on an annual basis. That's also going to help you write a clear and compelling budget narrative that demonstrates reasonableness and cost if you can back it up by some of those more granular estimates. Consider the resources that you will need for all aspects of implementation. So direct activity implementation is the most obvious, but also consider outreach, consider data tracking and reporting, consider financial tracking and reporting. All of these require human resources and human resources are expensive. So um, consider whether you'll need any consulting support, especially at the beginning to get your project up and running. We've seen some work grantees uh, do that. So in addition to the TA support that we provide under the Appalachian Regional Commission funding, uh, some grantees have also hired you know, contract um, grant advisor or project manager to really get them up and running at the beginning. And we've heard from those grantees that they've been really pleased with that decision. Understand the difference between contracts and subawards, as well as cost limitations, restrictions, and requirements. So there are federal definitions for the difference between contracts and subawards. We'll get into some of that later. 
They're both included in contractual, but you'll want to make sure that you know the difference and show them separately in your budget narrative. For other aspects where there's some discretion on your part, the most important thing is to have a policy, to follow your own policy, and to be consistent across federal grants. If you're monitored, that's what they're going to look for for quite a few of these things. So you want to think of your budget versus actual as a performance management analysis. If you're watching this, you probably take budgeting seriously, but I just can't stress this enough. Budgets scare people, but they're a communication tool and an internal monitoring tool, not just a finance tool. So make sure your narrative is clear enough that if a new program manager comes in and picks it up, they know what was and wasn't included in these broadcast categories. I've gotten many questions in the first three to six months of, of new work grantees or new work grants as the grantees start to implement them, where the project manager will come to me and ask if something is allowable. And in most cases, it was really based on what was written in their scope of work. And so we, you know, we go back to that and we take a take a look at it. And if it was approved, that, that it was, and if it wasn't, then it wasn't. And you know, so so really how you write it in your application is what's going to, you know, by and large, that's what's going to govern your um, your boundaries and implementation. So starting with the SF-424, the form really is pretty straightforward, but there are some sections you don't have to fill in and some specific pieces that you may not know about if you've never completed one of these before. Make sure that you have your unique identi identity um, excuse me, unique entity identifier from SAM.gov. Um, if you're not already registered, start that process ASAP. Also make sure that your subawardees know that they must also be registered and have a UEI um, once implementation occurs. They don't have to be registered at the time of application, but it doesn't cost anything to register with SAM.gov and to get a UEI, so you might as well start that process and, and have your subrecipients start that process as soon as possible. So go over some of the details, but again, that longer explanation is in the DOL training video that I mentioned, starting on their slide 15. So to complete the SF-424, some highlights on some of the items that jumped out to me. So item one, you're going to want to check application. Item two, it's a new application. Item three is going to be assigned by DOL, so you don't have to put anything there. And items four through seven can also be left blank. In item 10, you're going to enter D-O-L-E-T-A. With item 11, CFDA is 17.280, and you can find that on the cover page of the FOA. The CFDA title is WIOA Dislocated Worker National Reserve Demonstration Grant. So that's what you're going to enter there in item 11. And in item 12, the funding opportunity number, this is also on the cover page of the FOA, is FOA ETA 2213. And the title is Workforce Opportunity for Rural Communities Work, a Grant Initiative for the Appalachian and Delta Regions. Now you can leave item 13 blank. The format for item 16 is two characters for the state abbreviation followed by three characters for the district number. You can use all if all the districts in the state are affected. The only state in the ARC region where that would be the case is West Virginia because that's the only state um, that is entirely in the ARC region. For all other states, um, the state is only partially in the ARC region, so you will want to specify um, the congressional districts you know, by, by region that are actually covered. For item 17, your proposed start date for everyone will be October 1st, 2022. Your proposed end date is no more than 36 months. I believe so far every grantee that's been awarded has gone the full 36 months, which would be uh, September 30th, 2025. But, um, but you can technically do fewer than 36 months. And if you decide to do that, our recommendation here would be just end on a quarter, end with a quarter end date. Um, don't end in the middle of a quarter. You can, there's a restriction against that, but if you go even one day into the next quarter, you have to report on that entire quarter. So you might as well have implemented for the whole quarter. So if for some reason you decide to do less than 36 months, just pick, pick an end date that ends on one of the um, uh, fiscal quarters instead. With item 18, cost sharing and matching is not required for work, and you, you do not show leverage resources on the SF-424 or 424A ever. For item 19, you can check work is not covered by EO12372. 
And note that with item 20, the question about federal debt is in regards to the organization and not the signatory. Hopefully it's not the case with the signatory either, but just note that it's a question about the organization and not the person signing the form. With item 21, your authorized representative should have the organizational authority to sign for the application. This person can be the same as the point of contact identified in 8F, but we and DOL recommend having a point of contact and authorized representative who are two different people. Both roles receive official DOL communication and I've seen communication delayed because the same person was listed in both places. That one person didn't see things come through. And so their project team missed out on things like the new grantee convening or other you know, new grantee orientation, things like that that are coming out and other information required forms, deadlines, things like that. So it's not a bad idea to have two different people, um, although it's not required. Those are the highlights then of the uh, SF424. So a little more effort is required for the SF424A. Um, <clears throat> while none of the parts of your work application should be taken lightly, I can't stress enough the importance of a well-developed budget that is closely and logically tied to your implementation plan. The two need to inform each other and there will probably be some back and forth as you're drafting. So you have to have a pretty clear idea of implementation in order to develop a good budget, but in turn, your implementation may be constrained by the budget that you have available. So there are, um, there are several sections here to the SF424A, although some of them will be blank, so don't be too intimidated here. The big ones are section A, your budget summary, and section B, your budget categories. There's also a section for non-federal resources, forecasted cash needs, future funding, and other budget information. Um, so just note sections A through D for all, every time you're filling out the SF424A, should show budget items as a single function or activity for the entire period of performance. There are some grant competitions where you're asked to break it out by different types of activities or different periods of performance, for work, we're looking at one period of performance, which is your entire, you know, up to 36 months. Um, and it is, it is one activity, it's just your work funds. So there are a few specific things you'll wanna remember when you're budgeting for your project. So you may propose to expend no more than $100,000 of a work grant award on planning activities that support a broader implementation plan for a work grant. So that's new for this year. You will have to receive post-award approval if you have stipends and wages, wages for participants that exceed 20% of your total award um, and for capital expenditures. So generally, ETA encourages limiting equipment purchases and renovations to no more than 50% of the project budget. You can go over that. I would recommend if you plan to do that, read that section of the FOA very closely to make sure that you are providing the kind of evidence and support documentation that you need to, um, to make a case for why that's necessary. You'll want to treat program direct and indirect costs in line with the code of federal regulations and where there is discretion, and I mentioned this earlier, the same way across your federal grants. So that would be a monitoring item if they come and see how you treat things like indirect costs. You would just you want to be consistent. There's some um, latitude in how you do that at an organization, but um, you know, grant to grant, make sure you're doing it the same way. So starting with section A of the 424A, you'll see there are several lines you can potentially fill out depending on the application and its specifications. For work, we are just looking at line one. So uh, in column A, you have the CFDA title, we owe a dislocated worker national reserve demonstration grants. Column B is a CFDA number, 17.280. Column E is your total federal amount uh, being required, being requested. You do not show leverage funds on this form. Also, and I'll mention this again, if you have program income, you don't include that here. You're only asking for the federal funds um, on this, this part of the SF424A. You're going to skip lines two through four because, again, we are only worrying about this one grant opportunity, which is all captured in a single activity. Section B has quite a few sections here, and we're gonna take each one, each of the nine cost categories that you must use to budget your project. So personnel, fringe benefits, travel, equipment, supplies, contractual, construction, although this is actually not applicable uh, to, any, to any grant with the SF424A, um, other and indirect. In line I, you're gonna add the first eight cost categories together, so everything but indirect. And in line K, you're going to add total direct plus indirect to get your total total, total federal uh, request. 
All costs must be addressed in the budget narrative. Also note that program income generated from the program must be used for program activities. As I said before, everything goes in column one. Column one matches line one from the previous page. So I've, grant, I've seen grantees spread the budget out across these columns as if they're spreading them out across the three years, but that's actually, that's not necessary. Um, you you want to do that during your budget planning for your internal documents, but on the SF424A, you just include everything here in column one. So you're applying for the single grant program, you can use the single column. Um, you should have nothing in construction. So as noted, you may be able to do an amendment to pay for capital expenditures, but that goes in equipment. Construction and property acquisition are not allowable. Because the SF424A and the budget narrative go hand in hand, I'm going to jump over to an overview of the budget narrative, and then we'll walk through each, each co um, object cost category since they mirror each other. So as I mentioned, there's no specific format for the budget narrative, but it is strongly, strongly recommended you follow the cost categories on the SF424A. As I've discussed in other videos, do not make reviewers hunt for things because they will not. Um, your budget needs to be aligned across all the places it's discussed. So outlining your budget narrative according to those cost categories just makes sense. Your budget narrative is a place where you can explain how you came to the totals of each line item on the SF424A. It's your opportunity to justify those costs, to show the thoughtfulness that you put into them, and to demonstrate that they're appropriate and sufficient for achieving the stated objectives. You don't want to overestimate and, and have it look like you're requesting far too much, you know, way more money than you need. But, but on the flip side, you don't want to underestimate and be promising things that seem unrealistic for the amount of money that will be invested in them. So it's, it's all about finding that sweet spot and making the case for why that's necessary. So since I recommend writing your budget narrative according to the object cost categories, let's go through each of those categories in turn. First is personnel. This is salaries and wages of positions or portions of positions paid for with grant funds. You'll include fringe on the next line, so leave that out in this piece. You'll also include subrecipient funds later. So personnel of subrecipients goes in contractual um, and is part of their budget. And they should also be providing you with budgets that align with these object cost categories. Uh, but for the purpose of your SF424A as the lead applicant, this personnel includes personnel you will be paying for directly. So you will want to include in, in your budget narrative employees by job title, um, not necessarily by name, but by job title. If it's a new position, by the position description or the, or the position title. The salary for each, the total salary, as well as the percent paid for by the grant. So what the, how you're getting to the math there. The total compensation then across the entire grant period that you're paying to each position. And make sure you're keeping reasonable and consistent with similar work within and outside your organization. The second is fringe benefits, which should be reasonable and consistent with what similarly situated individuals within your organization and within your broader labor market receive. So in your budget narrative, explain the types of benefits included, as well as how you arrived at the number or at the, if you're applying a percent of benefits, um, if you have a standard that you use organizationally, however you do that, you can do it different ways to show your work. Um, on the SF424A, you're going to include the total amount of fringe that will be covered with the grant funds over your entire performance period. The third category is travel, and you'll want to explain who is going where, estimated at what time, time of year, um, you know, what, what project year, what project quarter if you can, and why the travel is necessary. When you're calculating this, include the number of trips as well as how you reached your figures. So did you use, um, you know, did you use estimates? Have you used historical costs? Do you use a mileage rate? Things like that. <coughs> Excuse me. So it is acceptable to provide estimates because DOL knows that travel is inherently unpredictable. Costs are very difficult to, to forecast, especially multiple years out. But you still must cite your computation basis. You can't just, you know, pull a number out. You have to give some evidence for how you arrived at that number. You also want to consider travel for all aspects of implementation, from outreach to meetings with partners, anything else outlined in your organization's travel policy. If you have multiple sites and it's in your organization's policy to pay employees for transportation between sites in the same day, let's say, you know, may, perhaps it's your organization's policy that you don't pay for commuting to their primary office, but if they're going to go from one location to another or they're going to drive to a meeting, you will, you know, you'll pay for mileage at that point. Make sure you factor all of that in. 
The biggest thing here is that it is very much in your interest to have a written travel policy and to follow it consistently or to use the federal travel policy. Next is equipment, and this is where you'd put any capital expenditures you'd like to budget for. Equipment must have a unit cost of $5,000 or more and a useful life of a year or more. Otherwise, if it does not meet either one of those criteria, the expense should be budgeted for in supplies. So as with other categories, you're going to describe in the budget narrative what the cost is, why it's necessary, and provide the estimated unit cost. Remember that you're going to need approval from your FPO before you can purchase equipment. This approval can take time and you cannot spend these funds until you have it. So with other categories, as with other categories, you'll need to justify your costs and how you arrive at them. But also consider that you're writing this estimate in May or June 2022, and maybe you won't be buying that equipment until January or March or June 2023. So consider what might happen to costs over the course of the next year or so. We've seen projects have significant delays because they didn't forecast an increase in cost over the year between writing it and procuring it, then they have to go do a budget modification if their entire, and their entire project is predicated on purchasing this new equipment and they're essentially stuck and losing time for the first six months or more where they can't train anybody if they're waiting on equipment to even you know, begin the first training class. So <clears throat> I'm not telling you to do or not do anything in your project design, just, just consider that timing when you're budgeting. Next is supplies, which is, of course, anything with a unit cost under $5,000 and or a usable life of a year or less. Your cost estimate basis for this could be vendor quotes, it could be historical cost your organization, some other defensible means, but, and this is a repeat of every other section, right? Just make sure you explain where these figures come from. That's what you do in your budget narrative. Contractual includes two types. Subawards, which are made to subrecipients who are carrying out part of the award on your behalf, and contracts, which are made to contractors who are providing goods or services, generally through a procurement relationship. The contractors are generally operating in competitive environments. They can provide their goods or services to others in the course of normal business operations. They don't generally have a say in the direction of the project, and they typically have a commitment to deliver goods or services by a specified date under a contract. Subawards are made to subrecipients, and the subrecipients have performance measures that align with the performance measures of their award. So they don't necessarily have all the same performance measures that you have, but their performance measures will roll up to some degree to the, the overall performance measures for the project. Subrecipients typically have programmatic decision making responsibilities, and they are using the funds to carry out the program for public purposes specific to the award. So that's really the difference between contractors and subrecipients. Subrecipients may be doing the same kind of work in other funded projects, but they're not really competing in an open market to offer it as a packaged service, for example. Instead, they're essentially carrying out the grant in your stead. So it, it's really important to know the difference between contracts and subawards, even though they, they get rolled up into, this, um, into the same line item on the SF-424A. In your budget narrative, you're gonna to need to explain the difference, but then the real difference comes in terms of implementation and your responsibility for things like procurement, for things like subrecipient monitoring. Um, you know, the, the difference in the type of um, relationship changes how you're going to, to treat it and changes the kind of responsibility that you have for it. So for some awards, in your budget narrative, you're going to provide the description of each entity and what the subaward will cover and also how much they'll receive. So note that as a pass-through entity with subawards, you are responsible for your subrecipients. You're going to have to conduct risk assessments, monitor their performance on a regular basis, but also through formal monitoring. You're going to have to um, you know, handle their funds back and forth. So their performance is your performance. So you need to choose your subrecipients very wisely. And again, for personnel budgeting, just make sure you understand that there probably will be some additional burden of subrecipient management that needs to go on. So you want to budget for that in the hours. <clears throat> you will also include all the funds that will be contracted out, so products or professional services, and provide a brief justification if you have any contractors already selected at the time of writing. You do not necessarily have to have those contracts, you know, specific software or things like that already selected. You can just drive it. You can pre-select it. If you do, just explain the process that you went through, um, you know, or, or some other justification for why they're being written into the budget narrative like this. Uh, for professional services, you also want to justify the necessity and the appropriateness, as well as the total amount of time that you would anticipate, um, you know, that, that professional spending as a contractor on your project. 
We skip G because I mentioned construction costs are not allowed. So capital expenditures would be in equipment. Don't fill it. You know, construction lines should be zero. Um, other in H might include rent, might be meeting costs or other costs that are not covered. So again, here, explain everything in your budget narrative. What is it and how much is it and why is it necessary and how are you reaching those totals? The last cost category is indirect. So you can use a negotiated indirect cost rate agreement in NICRA if you have one. If you don't, you can use the de minimis rate, which is 10% of modified total direct costs, MDTC. This is a section, if you are using de minimis rate, you wanna review what MDTC, MTDC includes. Not all direct costs are included in the MTDC. So you will want to include um, how much you plan to recover in indirect. And I can't stress this enough, be sure you're able to track these costs and be consistent across federal grants. So you can see here on this slide, the MTDC, it includes direct salaries and wages, includes applicable fringe benefits, materials and supplies, services, travel, up to the first $25,000 of each subaward. But it excludes any equipment you're buying, any capital expenditures, charges for patient care, rental costs, tuition remission, scholarships and fellowships, participant support costs, subcontracts, and the portion of each subaward in excess of $25,000. So when you do indirect, you want to make sure that you're calculating it correctly and you want to show your calculation in your budget narrative. <clears throat> One last item here, and it probably only applies to a few of you, but it is program income, which is listed at the very bottom of section B of the SF424A. You are allowed to generate program income from a work uh, or federal grant, work grant included, but the income must go toward project activities. You'll include this in line seven but do not add program income to any of the other totals, including your overall total reported on the SF-424. Do include it in the budget narrative, but if it's not applicable, you can just leave this blank and you don't have to address it in your budget narrative. Section C is about match, which is not required for work. If you do complete this section, you will need to report on it. So it is up to you how you want to treat it, but it is not required. So, you know, you can decide if it's something that you want to report on, um, you know, on your own for fun anyway. You can leave sections D and E blank as well. There are a few common mistakes that grantees make with budgeting that I want to mention here before we wrap up. And the first is calculation errors. We know how it is in the final scramble of grant writing, especially if you have subawards or anticipate contracts, but use a spreadsheet. Double and triple check your calculations, double and triple check that you've included the amounts on each form and they're identical across every place that you talk about them. We also see grantees sometimes misclassify costs or misapply indirect costs. So lean on your finance people if you have them and make sure you're following code as well as your internal policies. So much of grantee monitoring, that's certainly not all, is based on your own internal controls and policies. So don't guess here, you know, ask if you have had federal grants in the past, how different things have been treated. And to the greatest extent possible, as long as it's still, you know, still in line with code, continue to do that or have a clear justification for why you're making that change. <clears throat> Another one that we've seen is not considering historical projections or trends in costs. So under budgeting, or over budgeting for things like travel if you can find digital solutions instead. Uh, we sometimes see grantees wish they had budgeted more for support staff, thinking that a single program manager could do it all. These are large and complex projects. So consider the entire life cycle of getting a participant interested, screened, trained, coached, supported, finished, placed, and followed up with. That's a lot of different touch points with the same person. And so that takes a lot of human capital. Consider the capacity necessary to track and report on financial and programmatic performance, and consider all the ways you might want to support participants and what it will really take to do so. So at the same time, sending money back is embarrassing. So find that sweet spot where you're confident you're asking for, you know, as closely as possible, you're asking for what you need, you know, no more, no less. A few final reminders here, as you know, additional videos are available at arc.gov slash work. And we, we say this every time, but it's true. Start that sam.gov and grants.gov process, uh, grants process ASAP if you haven't. There are a couple of places you can um, submit technical questions. So the formal contact here is doleta dwg at dol.gov. If you want to reference this FOA and include the contact name and phone number they should respond to. 
And the next slide, you'll see my contact information. We would gladly help answer any questions we're legally able to answer um, if you have them. And you'll want to submit your application, of course, by Friday, July 8th, by 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time, only digitally through grants.gov. Thank you so much. We hope you have found this video useful. Again, you can contact me at nd at chamberlaindone.com. Note that there is no A in Chamberlain, and we'd be glad to assist you if we can. Best of luck with your work application.